Hi there, this is Carl Willits, and I am the vocalist of Memoriam, and you are listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Phantasm. Maximum Terror. Ah! That's your target audience, baby! Phantasm. You know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm. Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Hey, this is Dr. Vincent West, medical doctor. We've got a legend today on Phantasm with us, one of my favorite vocalists. Uh, most of you probably know him for his amazing work that he did with Bolt Thrower. We've got Carl Willits from Memoriam, his amazing new band that's been around for a while now. They're kick-ass, and they've got a new album out, and it's called Rise to Power. And Carl, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Well, that was a rather impressive introduction. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you about uh, Memoriam and our new album, Rise to Power. So, just to jump into this record, um, when did you guys start the writing process for Rise to Power? <laughs> Pretty much as soon as we finished uh, the last album. <laughs> That's the way we roll. Um, you know, basically, we got, we were driven by, um, by Scott's incessant uh, creativity. I mean, he is a powerhouse of writing. Uh, that's all he does. You know, he, he, he basically you know, does his day job, then comes home from work, uh, heads up to his studio, Riff Central Studios, and writes music all day, every day. Um, and as a result of that, we have got a, a, a absolute plethora of uh, material readily available for us to use in what we call his million dollar riff vault. Um, <laughs> so we very much it always rolls this way, you know. That's why we've been able to, you know, create and write songs at such a phenomenal frantic pace. We've done you know five albums in in seven years. So uh, it's still clearly down to Scott's um, prolific songwriting. Um, so. We started writing the word, the, um, the the music for uh, this album, Rise to Power, album number five, uh, pretty much straight after we'd released um, our fourth album um, to the end. So, and you know, the same process is is going at the moment. In fact, we went over to Rift Central Studios last week and uh, formulated and structured all the songs ready for album number six. So you know, we are, we're we're in an advanced position always to to write uh, music, but you know we, we've slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, we kind of COVID did ha make us kind of like have to you know stand back and take a, a bit of a breath because we couldn't get into the studio. Sure, record and keep that one year uh, rolling method up, and that's, it's kind of worked really well for us having a, an eighteen month gap in between albums as opposed to. A, a 12 month gap because it gives, it gives us that extra little six months to concentrate on the pre production of the albums, which we put into effect with the last album to the end, and again with this album Rise to Power. So, that extra six months gives us that little bit of extra time to, to you know, structure the songs. And for me, vocally, it gives me a, ch a chance to you know, demo the vocals, which is you know a, a new thing for me to do. I've never really done that in the past, so it cool. gives me a chance to, to uh, you know, get the words completely correct and in the right place and rewrite them and change them around a few times and also concentrate and, and find out if the structures and timings you know, that I've got in my head work rather than going to the studio and finding out that they don't work when we're there. So uh, it, that, that in itself is great and gives us the opportunity to be in an advanced position for when we get into the studio. You know, All I need to do for, from my perspective is concentrate on the delivery of the the the, uh, the vocals because the words are right, the structure's there. It's just delivery I can can focus on, and that I think has had a massively positive impact on the last album, and of course in turn this album also. So yeah, that's the way it rolls. And I say we're in a good position um, moving forward for album number six already. 
Excellent, excellent. And let's jump into this record. If you'll tell me a little bit about each song as we run through the record here. What about the first track? What can you tell us about uh, Never Forget, Never Again? That's a bit of a big, big opener for us. You know, um, I was particularly proud of that song. Um, obviously, it's about quite a, a fairly emotive subject, the Holocaust. Um, and, you know, from, from, from a lyrical perspective, which is really all I can talk about, because that's all I do, uh, it, it's a song that's taken me, you know, umpteen years to write. You know, it's one of those songs I've always wanted to write a song around this subject matter, but, you know, started it in the past and just didn't feel that the lyrics I was writing were, were strong enough or gave the, the subject matter the gravity and the, the justice that it deserved. So, um, when I heard the riff, that kind of really morose, melancholic riff that uh, that structures the song, uh, the breakdown, it, um, I thought that this is the one. And so I was, it was around about end of February last year, you know, if you, um, where there's you know, the, the um, annual um, Holocaust Memorial, um, Memorial Day. Um, and so I was watching lots of documentaries and reading lots of articles, uh, which were first-hand accounts of people that had, you know, experienced the uh, the Holocaust. Right. So I drew very much directly from the from their, their words. You know, use their their words in the lyrics that, that uh, feature in that song. So, yeah, I'm really proud of that. Um, finally, got round to actually writing that song, which I've been wanting to or trying to write for the past 10, 15 years, and uh, and yeah, really quite proud of the fact that it features as the opening track on the album, which uh, really kind of lays off cards on the table uh, from the outset. Very strong opening to the album. Very pleased with the way that that song has come together. It's a hell of a way to kick this record off, too. It's so good. Um, what about track two, Total? It draws, you, it draws you into the album quite nicely, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's a, a really kick-ass track to kick the album off. Uh, what about uh, track two, Total War? Total War? Okay, okay, that's been featured as a lyric video. It's like that was our uh, our second lyric video, which was released through Reaper a couple of weeks back. So people have had a chance to to digest that one. That's pretty full on, you know. It kind of like you know, it's kind of relentless. You kind of got the impact of song number one, then it then it kicks in with this this second track, Total War, which is just again a relentless fury of a song. Um, very much inspired. By lyrically, again, that's nice, that's what I can really talk about, um, is very much inspired by the uh, issues that are affecting the world that we live in today. You know, um, you may have kind of understood that I have built a career around writing songs about war. Absolutely. Um, and it just is ironic that at this very point in time, 2022, 23, we are facing a potential global war on our doorstep uh, in Ukraine uh, where, you know, we find a neo-fascist state uh, invading a sovereign state of Europe uh, under the pretext of denazification, which is uh, abhorrent and ridiculous considering the, the nationalist identity of uh, Putin and his cronies. Um, so, yeah, so that song very much was influenced by the events that are happening yeah, on our doorstep in Europe with the invasion of Ukraine. So we, we, I, I draw direct reference to that throughout that song in, in its entirety. So, yeah, it's just ironic, you know, the fact that I've, I've written songs about war for the past, you know, 30 years or so. And it just seems at this point in time that they, the, the, those words, those songs, bear more, unfortunately, bear more relevance now than they ever have done in the past, you know. And so that's really, it's, it, it does what it says on its cat on the camp. Total War, and that's what the song's about. Awesome, awesome. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, I Am the Enemy, track three. What about that one? I Am the Enemy. Yeah, well, that kind of refers, at the very start of the album, we got the um, the repeated, the, the, the kind of layered voices saying, I Am the Enemy, which was basically, we just got all our family and our friends, about 100 people, to, to just record that, that, that line on a voice memo, send it over to us, we layered it to formulate the intro the very start of the album so track number three refers directly to that intro and yeah a, a bit of a change in tempo a bit of a change in, in, uh, in, in this record a bit more uh, doomy in its um, in its attributes 
very kind of all I'd say when I first heard it I thought yeah it's got a bit of a paradise lost kind of edge to it you know which I definitely kind of like with, with like the idea of doing trying out something like that and doing something a bit different for us sure um, but I'm proud of that one lyrically because um, at the very start of it I have managed to insert yet again a uh, verse from my favoured poem of all time which is a poem called For the Fallen uh, by Lawrence Bignon uh, it's a famous one you know they shall grow not old as we as the left grow old they shall not weary them blah de blah you know that one that everyone knows um, which I've used in the past people may, re- may recognise that one but I've also used a verse from that poem on every memoriam album to date oh wow so every every album will feature a verse out of that poem on one of the songs so awesome that's what I like to do and so I managed to insert the uh, the ver- a, verse, a verse from that poem um, into the opening of that track and it works really well I'm really really pleased with the way that it fitted probably the best fitting verse that I've managed to fit into any of the songs that I've done so far from that poem so I was really particularly proud of that and um, yeah it's, it's, it's a bit I don't know maybe a little bit more commercial sounding than some of the other, to a certain, certain degree but yeah again it's a different tone a different texture and um, pushes the album along very nicely fantastic yeah, another great song uh, let's see track four The Conflict Is Within The Conflict Is Within yeah a lot of people say that's their favourite track. You know, I, I like that track as well. Um, it's obviously about, you know, the everyday struggle of a life that we all go through. I think that can, you know, the, the lyrics to that song resonate quite uh, deeply with, with, with people. We can connect it to people. Because it's all about that internal struggle that we all have to exist and, um, and get, on, get on in our lives. Um, took the extra title from a Commando uh, magazine. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> really, that's what I um, and uh, so yeah, I particularly like the end section of that um, that section where it's more like you know about kind of like you know reasoning uh, is circumspect and all that. So so yeah, I really, really like the way it breaks down at the end. Again, a different tone, a different texture. I think one of the consistent themes of this album is there's a lot more melody. More melodic in, in many respects, this album than maybe the previous ones we've done. So um, there's lots of different tones and textures, but the overall sound of the album is quite melodic in its uh, in its entirety. So I think that's the standout difference between this and our our previous album. So yeah, and that is you know key within that song as well. The conflict is within. Awesome, excellent. And let's see uh, track five, Annihilation's Dawn. Uh, I think that's the start because I always view these, these tracks uh, as vinyl. That's the way I. Oh, always sure. Always. So yeah, it's it's sad too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so basically, we're now on the opening track of side two. Uh, so, so yeah. So I see that the songs we spend quite some time uh, working out which song's going to go where. There's a, there's a there's a journey that goes through. It sometimes gets lost if you listen to it on. You know, digital downloads and, and pick out tracks here and there. You know, they, they kind of sometimes lose the, the the overall continuity and the thread that we we like to, to do. But yeah, Annihilation is dawn again, again about the downfall of, of of mankind. A war themed track again. A very good opener to side two of the album as well. Um, yeah, I mean, again. It's a, it's a very strong track, and a lot of people have been saying that's their favourite track. It's, it's quite interesting because from talking to all these people over the past you know week or so, doing interviews, lots of people have come to me and they've got different ideas about which is their favourite track, which is which is great for for our perspective because there's lots of different things in like the, the, the different songs as well, which can construct them and make them the way they are. So. So yeah, Annihilation's Dawn again about the downfall of mankind and. Um, War, scorched earth policy, you know, uh, again, drawing direct reference to the war uh, that is on our doorstep here in Europe. Right. Uh, it's, it's a great track. Uh, let's see, uh, track six, All is Lost. All is Lost. Now, that was the opening opus that we kind of uh, unleashed upon the world with our first 
video release. Again, it was um, the first proper full-length feature video that I have ever created since I started being in a map for 30 years ago. Oh, wow. Just kind of lyric videos, which are simple and effective and quite nice, but I've never been and, you know, had a scripted, um, you know, full-on production video where there's actors involved and, you know, getting dressed up in and, and kind of like wardrobe and, you know, being on location for two days at, at various sites. Uh, so the whole experience of putting the video together of that track which has won some awards, I'll have you know, um, with Eulogy Media. Um, was in, an incredible experience, you know. Uh, I mean, at this point in our career where I've been doing such a long time, it's amazing to still be able to uh, have these new experiences, you know. Um, you would have thought at some point you've done it all, seen it all, but this is, again, another new concept for us. And it was a great, great experience to do that. The song itself is a song about hope, even though it's called All Is Lost. <laughs> it's a song about, you know, kind of looking to the future and where everything seems down, you know, making the best of the situation, you know, self, self-belief. Uh, that's what the song is about. Now, there is a little riff in there, which is a bit of a curveball from my perspective. There's a riff in there, which is almost, almost black metal. <laughs> I mean, once I put my dulcet tones on it, and I, I kind of like, uh, I, I, you just kind of dilute it a little bit. But there is a, yeah, so we have played around with different influences and different kind of ideas on this album, more so maybe where we've done in the past. I think that, that shows the general yeah, confidence uh, in Scott in his writing ability and our, and our um, attitude to, to try out new things, you know. You're not very influenced for vocally um, and delivery style on my killing joke that's one of my favourite bands so I kind of like, often see a little reference to them in a lot of the songs that nice. delivery that I, I attempt to do uh, uh, poor man's poor man's jazz moment uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's my hero um, so um, so yeah so all is lost the you know, uh, opening track uh, well, not the opening track the opening uh Gamut that we've put out to the public, so people should be well aware of that one. Now it's gone down really, really well. And again, a different tone, different texture, um, and features very, very fits really well to the flow of the album. Yeah, that's a really strong track. I really like that one. Uh, let's see, track seven, the title track, Rise to Power. Rise to Power. Yeah, we curveball that one. Obviously, it's the title track, uh, so it's kind of like. Referring to the uh, Mr. Purple Man on the album cover, ah. sitting there in his throne, rising to power. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll call him Bob. That's his name. No. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's straightforward, straight down the line. It's about kind of connecting with people and building your strength and. It's kind of anthemic in a way. It's got a bit of a, 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 a weird, the, the weird curveball for me is the timing structure at the end. That's a really, really off, weird offbeat to start. To, uh, bat, I'm bound to get it wrong. I'm going to play it live. Bound, so I'm never going to get it right. <laughs> it was something that Scott was really, really adamant that he wanted to have in there. And he, he had to really co- kind of coach me on how the timing structure worked on that one because it is quite offbeat in many respects. But it works really, really well. And he has, has a title track for the album. Yeah, it's a great, a great stomper, sing along, uh, fist in the air. Anthemic track, indeed. So yeah, it is, had to be the one that we used as a title track. Excellent, excellent. It's killer. Uh, let's see, and then the final track, track eight, this pain. The final track, the the sorrowful, the sorrowful, mournful track, which is actually my favourite one. It seems that way. On all the albums that we do, these the closing track generally seems to be my favourite track. Maybe because the album's finished, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's because it's I, I don't know. Maybe we save all the kind of the big epic songs for the end, the, the crescendo. You know, again, it starts with a you know kind of like kind of a bit of an acoustic guitar. Never done that before. A bit of a aha box, you know, kind of like in the background, which which is something really different. I think Scott has been working on that track for some time I think we just attempted to squeeze it into the last album but it didn't really work or fit so right. he, he shelved it and he saved it uh, for the end of this album and as a 
as a you know an epic uh, closing track to the album, it, it's it's killer. You know, it's, and um, again, it, it's all a song about hope. You know, uh, about the, the, the pain and the suffering that we all go through in life, and we all go, we've all been through it. You know, or heartache and, and grief and loss and sorrow and the pain that it causes with it. You know, and it's just temporary. You know, it's something that's never going to last forever, and ultimately makes us the people that we are. Formulates our identity, makes us stronger. It doesn't kill us. Uh, and really, that's what that song was all about. Is that kind of like that, that the rising through the pain uh, to to find and create a better life. And it's a, a very nice point on which to end the album as well. So yeah, in that respect, it works really well. And yeah, it takes you through through a nice little journey. So yeah, I'm really really pleased with the way that all the songs. Um, have, come together and fit together so well on the album sometimes I think maybe on this album the storyline works flows a lot better but maybe you know, some of the tracks on previous albums like Jump Out and, and are jarring and change uh, and, and maybe it doesn't flow so well but this album in particular flows in my opinion flows really well and uh, very 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 pleased and very proud with the way it has all come together and is being generally received by everyone so yeah it's great great stuff that was my favourite track as well the last track good man you see you got the same taste as me <laughs> <laughs> I mean the last track the last track on the, on the last album uh, to the end as my heart grows cold that was my favourite oh track it was well. killer but ironically these big epic tracks are generally last words off the first album again one of my favourites uh all songs that we never end up playing live because they're too big. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so yeah, we've got that, that nice little struggle now to try and like fit these extra songs into our our live set. So that's that's going to be our next um, sit down and uh, work out which songs work and which songs don't work and which ones we're going to fit into our our live set for when we finally get back out on the road and start doing gigs again. Which nice. Looking forward to. And what about the uh, it's such a great record? Thank you so much for doing that. What a, what about the cover art for Rise to Power? It's it's fabulous. Well, you know, Mister Dan Seagrave, you cannot go wrong with a Seagrave cover, can you? No, he <laughs> it out of the ballpark on every occasion, and you know, it's, it's one of those things that are consistent with us here at Memoriam. You know, when we first saw started out here, you know, when we first sat down, we thought, okay, well, if we're going to do this properly. Let's, let's let's work out what we want to do. You know, obviously, we wanted to kind of create that old school death metal feeling. You know what, what it was like when we first started out in the late eighties, you know, early nineties. Sure. And uh, so, obviously, we kind of decided to, to try to release an album every year, or you know, within a, 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 at a fast pace. And um, yeah, you know, Scott in particular said, "Well, you know, uh, we all went around and what the room said. Well, what, what would you like to achieve?" It's, so, so, it's, Let's play certain places. Or it's, yeah, let's, let's release album a few quick. And Scott's main thing on his list was he'd like to have an album cover by uh, by Dan Seagrave. And here we are, five albums down the line, five Dan Seagrave covers, and uh, I think we've achieved that for him. So, um, so yeah, it's great. It's great to work with Dan. Uh, all we do is we, we find a, a, a list of random ideas of what roughly what the songs the album title is going to be what kind of colour scheme we'd like and really what we envisage uh, the, the the image to be the central image and then he just goes away and comes up this you know crazy dystopian future uh, and he comes up with a variety of sketches from different perspectives perspectives uh, for us and then we choose which perspective we like the best, and then it goes away. And we're continually part of that creative process. And it's, um, you know, it's a sheer joy to, to watch those rough, random ideas that are in your head be put into prints and see them coming together through the sketching process and the inking process. And seeing the final product at the end of the day uh, is incredible. And I'm, I would particularly say that on this occasion, he has knocked it out of the ballpark with this album. I think it's my favourite. Out of all of them, I think. It's incredible. Now, had you worked with him before with Bolt Thrower? Had you ever worked with Dan? Or No, I've never worked with Dan before. You know, we, we were strictly uh, different artists. Um, 
you know, you've got like James Workshop artists, Pete Nifton, people like that. Well, sure, sure. Author. But, Frank, but, but Frank had worked with uh, Dan uh, for Benediction. Nice. For Benediction Killers. Uh, and so that was a connection. So we had that connection with him. So when we approached him, uh, it wasn't like we were a bunch of randoms from nowhere. He knew, he knew Frank. <laughs> uh, we twisted his arm. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those elements of memoriam now that he's a constant. You know, we are, you know, creatures of, of, of habit. And once we find something and we like it, we stick to it. You know, it, it becomes one of the formulas, for that blueprint that makes it work for us. Yeah? So it's a Dan Seagrave. I don't think we can actually now, at this point of our career, uh, release an album uh, without a Dan Seagrave cover. He wouldn't feel right. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so we've, we've set our parameters rather high. So I'm hoping he's, he's not going to be too busy to do album number six, which we are hoping to schedule for later on this year. So I'm going to have to drop him a quick email and say, look, Dan, uh, this is my idea. Go for it. And the whole creative progress uh, process will then kick off once again. But yeah, there's a few, a few things that define what we do. You know, what the artwork is one. You know, it's a, it tells a story, a nice linear story throughout the five albums, six albums coming up. Um, but also, you know, going down to Parlour Studios, we, we, we started using Russ, Russ Russell. You know, great, great, the infamous Mr. Russell on <laughs> album number three. And again, I think that once we found him, he was like almost a missing, a missing X factor for us. And we feel that he is, again, one of those parts of the blueprint, the, uh, the formula for, for what makes work, it work for Memoriam as well. So his contribution to what we do uh, can't be understated on either. So, uh, yeah, all these little factors make it what it is and make it uh, the pleasurable experience to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Dan, I mean, he really did. This is one of the best covers I've seen in a long time. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> I'm just sitting here looking at oh, it right yeah, now. His, his attention to detail is, 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 is absolutely, you know. I mean, he, he, every time I still, even now, every time I look at that cover, I, I, I notice a different little bit of detail which he's put in there, um, you know, which is, which is great. You know, and then for me, you know, I grew up, you know, going, saving your money up and then on a Saturday going to the record shop and buying an album and then you're know, kind of looking at the album on the bus on the way home and you're know, taking in the whole cover so it's the whole kind of like you know experience of we view visual we always view things as, as vinyl from that because we're from that era and you know that having that big artwork you know in the poster as well it's, it's great you know so seeing it in that the detail is, is incredible and uh, makes the experience that much greater it's outstanding. It really is. Um, I was going to ask you too. With this many albums in with Memoriam, is it is it hard to for you guys to build a set list for live shows now? Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you guys have the your previous bands. I'm not sure if you play that stuff with Memoriam, but I I, I figured, God, now you've got so much Memoriam material. I bet that's that's a whole other thing. Yeah, when we first started out and we only had one album, you know, that we did introduce a couple of old uh, Bolt Thrust tracks into the set just because we needed some, some songs to write. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, sure. Uh, but by album number two, three, we, made, we kind of we got sufficient material to, to get away with our own stuff and we dropped all that, you know, because it wasn't really doing us, doing us any good, kind of harking back to the past a while. Victoria, please! Uh, my little girl. Uh -huh. um, so, um, so yeah. So at this point, five albums in, it's going to be an epic. I say that is going to be our next battle. Uh, we'll be uh, meeting up in the rehearsal room, and what we'll tend to, what we'll probably do is we'll jam through all the songs. The yeah, eyes are four place in a live in a, in a live setting, obviously in the rehearsal room, and from that point, we'll probably get a, a feeling as to what songs are going to work playing them live and which songs won't sound so good. You know, some of the big songs that we do, as I mentioned before, the, uh, you know, uh, this pain might not work so well in a live footing, but who knows? Sure. So we have, we're going to, um, we'll have to pick two or three tracks, which means potentially we'll probably just extend our set list a little bit, you know, our time, because we have been, we do, we're a bit lazy, really, when we come to play in life. Our set is only about 45 minutes. Um, so we have got a, a bit of room for manoeuvre to add maybe three 
maybe four, well, they're quite long songs, aren't they? Uh, maybe three more songs onto that set list. So, yeah, so our, our set list will feature yeah, tracks from our previous albums. Uh, maybe we'll have to jump one or two. But, yeah, we'll be, it's, it's, it's a happy position to be in, you know, to, to be able to... Oh, yeah. Yeah. To, three more tracks off this album off the top of my head I I think it's going to be the three songs that have been released as videos nice. uh, I, 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 I've, got, I've got a feeling that it's going to end up being All Is Lost Total War and obviously the title track Arise to Power I've got a fear, sneaky feeling that those are the three that will probably end up being inserted into the live set more, off, more likely than not but uh, it's a question of what's this space that's fantastic. That's fantastic. This record is so good, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very, very pleased with the way it's being received. You know, people, I think people, people get it. You know, people are starting to get it now, and it, it's really kind of pushed us, uh, you know, onwards. A, a step. Each album we do, you know, just, there's a, a progression with each album we do. You know, I think we're building confidence. We're, we're maybe moving away from uh, the things that we've done in the past, which is kind of a bit of an eternal struggle. But uh, we're very, very, I think people are now starting to accept us who we are and not what we were, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. Uh, which Absolutely. is great. Which is great. We're, we're, and um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. The support we've been receiving off, off everyone. And that's, yeah, we're, we're, we're very grateful for that. You know, we, 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 we appreciate and are aware that we're only really in this privileged position to be able to be doing this after 30 years because of people such as yourself that support us for, you know, giving us interviews, people that read your magazines or, or watch the podcasts or, or and come to the geeks. They're the people that count at the end of the day. They're the people, they're the people that, that really matter to us. And to get such positive feedback off, you know, our friends, family, fans, whatever you want to call yourself, is truly amazing. And um, we feel very privileged and honoured to be able to be doing this after all this time. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. I just had one final question for you. If you don't mind, just real quick. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been a fan of Bolt Thrower through my teens and into my adult life. Yeah, that's no. I know it's going to be no. <laughs> but but I, just, I was just curious. Did you have a, a fun tour story of Bolt Thrower? Oh my god, uh, after doing it for such a long time, yeah, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of store, store, store stories, none of which can be revealed <laughs> to the general public. It's that firmly in my mind and in my heart, and I'm not dishing the dirt on no one. Uh, <laughs> I think there's one or two, you know, I think one, a, a great one, uh, okay, a, a simple one is, uh, yeah, I was in, uh, in America actually, over, uh, in, uh, did a few gigs, uh, when was it? 2006, something like that, I don't know. We nice. The autopsy. And we were over at the uh, LA, I think it was, Metrobol Opera Place, I don't know. Anyhow, I lost my voice. My voice had gone completely. You know, it was dry heat. I've been in Vegas, I've been shouting a lot and drinking a lot. And, uh, you yeah, it was about four or five gigs into the, the, the schedule of gigs we were doing and you know got, got there got to the gig and um, couldn't talk and it was horrible horrifying because one of the things I like doing is talking <laughs> uh, and as a front man uh, uh, as a front man my job is to kind of communicate you know, with the audience that's seeing about, about the engagement and the fact I couldn't actually physically talk was really really uh, frustrating and potentially quite worrying to think that I had to actually go on stage and um, you know in, and, and perform whilst I couldn't actually talk so you know I sat down with, with my good friend Mr Chris Ryford from <laughs> Autopsy and he sat down with me and said look I've got a top tip for you here mate this is what we have to do and he handed me a bottle of Jack Daniels and said right drink as much as you can as quick as you can <laughs> so we sat there by the side of the stage and he forced, forced me to drink half a bottle of whiskey in about half an hour and um, he said by the, by the time you finished it or you know A you'll be so drunk you know we don't care and, and, and you'll forget about you'll forget <laughs> about the, 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 kind of like the, the fear of, of not being able to, to talk on stage and uh, he was right you know I, I did get um, blind drunk but you know the fact that I couldn't talk 
maybe helped. Oh, I was a bit, bit, uh, bit, you know, a bit worse to wear. But it kind of helped me. Maybe I overcompensated with the performance. You know what I mean? So I kind of think I probably better can talk, but I engaged in different ways. And ultimately, the vocal style that we do, the delivery, doesn't really come from the throat. It comes from down, down further down in the, in the chest. So I could still deliver the vocals. And it ended up being a very, very good gig and a great performance. So there you are. Top tip to any vocalist that loses their voice. Drink as much whiskey as you can in as little time as possible. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's incredible. <laughs> Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure. I was sponsored by Chris Weifert. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, we've, we, we've chatted a couple times. He's, he's a great guy. I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Kids, pick up Rise to Power uh, from Memoriam. It fucking kicks ass. It's so good. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today, sir. I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan for years, and I, I'm, I love that you still do music. It's amazing. It's incredible. Well, it's been a pleasure to have this opportunity to touch you this evening, Vincent. I'd like to say thank you and hello to everybody over there in Florida and the U.S. of A. And uh, who knows, at some point in the future, we may even get over to your shores to do some shows. If not, hop on a plane and come see us in Europe. Great. Absolutely. Dude, thank you so much for this. It's been a pleasure. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. I wish you all the best. Nice one, Vincent. Always a pleasure, mate. And hopefully we may just get to speak again in about 18 months' time on the release of album number six. I would love it. <laughs> all the best, and Thanks very much for your time, mate. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm.